Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Kia. And welcome everyone to tonight's Writer to Writer program. Um, we are just really excited that you're joining us for this program, which promises to be a very interesting and enlightening conversation between Hmong writer, playwright, performer, and educator, Mei Li Yang, and Somali American educator, artist, and small business owner, Anissa Haji Muhammad. So a little, just a little bit about more than a single story. We are a Twin Cities-based organization whose mission is to position the literary arts as a catalyst for cross-cultural healing and social justice. And we connect BIPOC writers with broadly inclusive communities through readings, public conversations, writing workshops that foster insight, empathy, and literary skill building. Many thanks to Hennepin Library and especially to Kia Vang for partnering with us on, in so many ways. Um, we're really, really grateful for this partnership. Um, we'd like also to like to invite you to join us for another partnership with Hennepin Libraries um, in which novelist A. Raphael Johnson will lead a four-part workshop series for National Novel Writing Month in November. So we invite you to visit our website and also visit the library's web website and uh, sign up for our monthly newsletter in order to stay up with our events and activities. So I'm very excited about tonight's conversation partners. I can't wait to hear them explore the intersections of creativity, culture, and spicy community tea. They will discuss the unique challenges of navigating the world as writers, as business owners, and third culture kids, and their deep ties to their communities. There is so much I could say about these amazing women, but I'm going to introduce them and then turn it over to them so that we can hear them speak for themselves. And as Kia mentioned, we will have time for Q&A after, and uh, we'd like for you to fill out the survey that she will be posting later. So. Mei Li Yang is a Hmong American writer, performer, and educator. Her plays include The Korean Drama Addict's Guide to Losing Your Virginity and Confessions of a Lazy Hmong Woman. Her debut poetry collection, How I Lost My Name, will be published in spring 2025 through Sundress Press. Her work has been supported by grants from the Bush Fellowship, the Finnovation Fellowship, the McKnight Fellowship in Playwriting, and others. She teaches creative writing at the University of Minnesota and is in the process of launching Mayhem Games, a board game company that centers Asian American experiences. Very exciting. And her con she will be in conversation with Anissa Haji Muhammad, who is a Somali American educator, artist, leader, and small business owner. Fleeing civil war, Anissa emigrated to the US at the age of five and settled in California before moving to Minnesota. She holds degrees in applied linguistics and is dedicated to education and community empowerment, creating cultural assets like My Diasporic Diary and Kalsuni Affirmation Cards. An advocate for Somali culture, she promotes positive representation and has been featured in various publications. Beyond her professional life, she engages in research and creative endeavors exploring themes of mental health, identity and home, inspiring positive change and understanding within communities. So let's welcome Mei Li Yang and Anissa Haji Muhammad. We'll turn it over to them now. Thank you so much, Carolyn, for inviting us to this stage. And thanks for Hennepin County as well, and all of you for joining us on a Thursday night. So, so uh, oh, sorry, go ahead, <laughs> Anissa. I'm sorry. I was just saying, it's so nice to be here with you, and thank you for everyone. Yeah, I'm really excited tonight because I feel like sometimes when people look at, you know, um, you know, different communities, right? It, it be, I think it's hard for folks to see some of the connections, but you know, uh, my family came to this country in 1979 as Hmong refugees, and I myself was born in a refugee camp uh, in Bonavina, Thailand, and so I feel like. Um, when I saw the Somali community um, coming into Minnesota, I was just like, there are many things that are different within our cultures, but then there are also some similarities. And so I've always felt like there's, anyway, so many connections that could be made. And I'm glad we get to dig into that a little bit tonight. So. Yeah. Thank you. 
Well, Anissa, I could be wrong, but I have was having trouble hearing you. But right, let, I'm having trouble hearing you. Mm -hmm. oh. Okay, try that again. the headphones. How's that? Better? Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> um, so I was saying that um, it's so nice to be here and have this conversation with you. Um, it's interesting because I had exposure to the Hmong community more mm -hmm. uh, intricately, more so than uh, the Somali community. Like my family came in 1993, uh, also as refugees. Um, I was born in Somalia, but like two years after I was born, a uh, civil war broke out. And so the majority of my life I spent in Fresno, California, which we were discussing has the biggest population mm -hmm. of Hmong. Uh, in the whole country. And so it's kind of feels like a full circle moment being here and having us compare our communities and, you know, mm -hmm. compare and contrast. Yeah. Um, I think Anissa and I were talking about how uh, we, I think we might want to, we're going to share some poems, talk about some stuff and then share some more poems and then come and talk about, talk about more things. So that's sort of the format. Um, do you want to kick things off, Anissa, or do you want me to kick things off with first poem? Um, sure, I, I can go ahead and share my first poem. So we have four different themes that we're going to cover. The first is culture and language. And so the first uh, poem that I will be sharing is called Mahakamakan. And to give you some context about what that actually means, Mahakamakan is a phrase that's often used by elders in our community and parents. And it means like what's missing from you in kind of a, a rhetorical way. If uh, the youth complain about like depression or anxiety or any ill, they um, the parents and elders automatically ask like, how could you complain? Like we went through so much worse. We were living in a refugee camp. We went through colonialization, some of them. And so Mahakamakan is like, what's missing from you? And so in mm -hmm. this poem, I have a young person respond to all of the things that are indeed mm -hmm. missing. Mahakamakan. peace of mind, a respite from overthinking, of resting at night like others and entering the garden of dreams. Instead, I lie awake, regretting what was before, anxious of what is to come as the present continues to elude me. Wahaigamakan, a mental burden lifted. I carry the expectations of achieving dreams unfulfilled, of crossing boundaries unnavigated attaining accolades and diplomas, of carrying the torch of hope with my bare hands, of not wincing, not complaining as the fiery flames of this force roll engulf me completely, leaving no residue of who I was or what I could have been. Wahaigamakan belonging, to feel at home in my own home, in my own bones, not too black for this crowd, too white for the other, too foreign for this circle, too Western for the other, how can I identify when all that I identify with rejects me? I am a nameless, faceless ghost, longing for and seeking out familiar leaves, friendly waters, founded foundations, something to call my own. Wahaigamakan acceptance that depression is not a myth, a conspiracy of Galo, a break from tradition, a rebellion against religion, a coup, overthrowing all that you know, disregarding all that you do. It's an illness, a dark cloud, a swallowed pain, a bottomless well of emptiness. Wahaigamakan, honesty, that you too hurt, that in the wrinkles beneath your eyes and between the gaps in your teeth, on the calluses of your palms, that you carry pain that traveled miles with you, that you too are hurting, that bloodshed can be washed from your hands, though not so easily from your mind, that you feel alone, that you feel without a home, that you lie awake many nights, worrying about what has been and what is yet to come, that I put a name to your pain, that I put a name to my pain, that I put a name to our pain, that together we can overcome. Oh, that was beautiful. And um, you already know I'm sort of obsessed with names. And so I just love that litany. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. So this one was uh, is heavily mental health related, but also mm -hmm kind of touches on uh, the cultural and uh, language aspect, because I think as a young person being in the Somali community, you always feel on the outskirts of your community, like you're not mm -hmm. accepted by anyone. And I think that's something that we can both resonate with being like a third culture kid. Mm -hmm. and, um, what, are, what are some of your experiences with that? Yeah, I mean, so um, the poem I'm going to share is about language. Um, but I, I will say, being Hmong is, it, it, it's, it, it's, I have an interesting relationship to language because um, 
throughout all my life, people have been like, why don't you speak better, Mog? Uh, even as an adult, I remember um, when I had published this children book, children's book, this is 10 years ago. Uh, I mean, sorry, 2012 or something like that. I went to go speak in a first grade classroom at a Hmong charter school. And, you know, uh, my book is in English, but, you know, the people, the teachers were like, Miss May, can you speak in Hmong? And I'm like, yeah, I guess I could. And it had been a while. And later, this little Hmong girl came up to me. She's like, Teacher May in Hmong. She was just like, Teacher May, Teacher May, how come my Hmong is better than yours? I'm like, hmm, okay. <laughs> it's because you're going to a Hmong language charter school, okay? And when I was your age, people kept telling me I needed to learn English. Or, you know, even when I spoke English perfectly fine, I was being pushed to um, take like ESL classes, right? Mm -hmm. English is a second language class. Yeah. And so I think language is always kind of complicated. You need English to survive in this world. Uh, and also um, Hmong language is sort of, you know, we always talk about how it, it was, you know, we're orally based culture. And even though in the 1950s, we started like um, our written language was, you know, created, it meant it still meant that people of my parents' generation, many of them didn't learn, grow up with a written mm -hmm. language, right? Didn't, didn't grow up reading writing. Right. And so um, all of that institutional knowledge in their head, you know, kind of didn't get lives, passed on. Yeah. It lives in their head. <laughs> yeah. They go beyond yeah. that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I, I guess I'll share my my piece, Birth, which I wrote in, in 2018, 2019. I took a Hmong language, language class at the uh, University of Minnesota with B. Vang Mua. So she's the teacher I'm referring to in here. Hmm. So I, I wrote a lot of poems in her class, actually. Um, birth. One, humility is when you are learning the landscape of your tongue and realize it is broken, like your hands, which cannot measure salt or slice the spine of a pig. You have mistaken a chair for a mountain. Correction, you have reduced a mountain to a chair. Two, Hmong words are birthed in three parts. The father letter begins the life. The mother letter navigates the in-between spaces. My teacher says, are the letters that hold the memories of sound. They determine your destiny, whether you become a flower or a blanket, a breath or a stick. Three, in the Korean drama, Devilish Joy, the hero suffers from Cinderella amnesia. At midnight, he forgets all his memories of the previous day. He takes Polaroids. He writes a daily log of important activities. I leave traces of my existence behind, he tells us. But he doesn't include his meeting with the heroine or why he abandoned a pair of expensive shoes. Even undocumented, the heroine haunts him because the body remembers what the mind cannot. Four. A bump on my right middle finger, as calloused as my heel. Earlobes so smooth they can hide that summer they'd been pierced for 14 days. Uneven breasts, uneven feet, uneven eyes. A mother buried without her womb. A father who spoke to Leah when no one was around. I should have asked whether Leah was a monkey, a communist, or his sister back in Laos. Five, the body is a landscape of clues. So, my poem. That was beautiful. And, and you. Uh, how many classes did you take um, at the U of M in Wong? Was that the only one you took? or? Um, I took one semester and it was four days a week. And so uh, I took one semester and then the second semester I took a Hmong reading class so that we could actually, um, you know, it was a higher level class. Um, you know, uh, where, yeah, we read original, like, um, what do they call it? I should know this. But anyway, where we read original texts in Hmong. And that was really fascinating to kind of parse things out. Ooh, My Hmong is still not that great, but like I know a lot of fancy words now. <laughs> you know, I, I say that, but then I need to, to then that that makes people think I don't speak Hmong at all. I'm like, no, my Hmong is pretty, pretty decent, right? But it's not like, it's not as strong as my English. And oh. I think what's interesting is I always tell people I can, I took French in college, in high school and in college. I can read French much more quickly than Hmong because Hmong just is a different kind of, I don't yeah. know. Yeah. So my question for you is like, after you took those classes, did you feel like you were showing up differently with your art and then in the community or was there any um, impact there? Yeah. I mean, uh, I educated people about the things I learned. Like, uh, mm -hmm. so I have this web series that my husband and I had created called Monk Organization, which is uh, like a comedy about 
it's kind of like the office except hmm. at a Hmong nonprofit. <laughs> <laughs> and so I actually incorporated it. So one of the characters in the um uh, in that show is uh it's among expert, mm-hmm. you know, and so yeah. I I use a lot of the knowledge from my class to infuse that into like the the Hmong expert character in that show. Mm-hmm. Um but also it made me really just appreciate the language more. I have a different poem which I won't read, but um I have to give props to B Veng Mo at the U of M to help me understand things like even uh, articles, right? The word the in English, it's just the, the mm-hmm. apple, the sun, the mm-hmm. street, the book. But I never thought about it in this way, but she's like, she's really good at articulating things, making things, naming things, right? Making them transparent. She's like, in the Hmong world, the word the, it depends on the context in which something is used, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, if something is round, the is lu. If yeah. something is like, um, you know, like a poem, it's a ja, it's, you know, mm-hmm. if it's, uh, if it's a tool, it's a, a da. Mm-hmm. She's like, but in the Hmong world, a pen is not a tool. So it's, thu, it's a long thing. Anyway, whatever. I'm, I'm maybe yeah, I'm getting in the weeds here. No, that's fascinating. Honestly, but all yeah. to say, like, these are the words that we use all the time, but it was mm-hmm. great to hear her name. This is how we come up with articles in Hmong, you know? That's, yeah. that's fascinating. I can relate in that uh, people in the Somali community are very quick to tell you that you don't have the best Somali. Um, and it, sometimes it's based on just like a few seconds of interaction, which is mm-hmm. baffling to me. I'm just like, give me a chance first. Um, and so with with not growing up with a Somali community, I feel like I had this longing for both my culture and language. And I actually mm-hmm. taught myself how to read in Somali. Mm-hmm. Um, but my conversational Somali is is lacking in compared to other domains. Mm-hmm. Um, and so uh, I feel like I developed uh, what's called linguistic insecurity, mm-hmm. which is actual real psychological fear mm-hmm. of speaking um, your language, your heritage language, because of uh, so many negative experiences. Mm-hmm. Um, and I feel like my love of language and reading, like the good thing is that it did lead me to get into linguistics, which is a study of language. Um, but I still struggle every day with language. I still um, i am a, I'm a very fierce advocate of um people reclaiming both their language and culture and not feeling Mm -hmm. like they're quote unquote like second class citizens um Mm -hmm. there was a podcast that I was listening to and one of the um one of the guests actually referred to people who didn't speak strong Somali as second class citizens Mm -hmm. and I got so upset that I wrote to the host and I was like why did he say that that's so rude that's so isolating we need to move away from those like narratives we need to move away from those perspectives and um, in the work that I do, whether it's art, whether it's writing, whatever it is, I encourage people to just like fully show up and 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 also realize that language is language. Mm-hmm. <laughs> language can improve. Like there's no deadline to mastering the language and there truly is no mastering of language. You're always right. learning something new. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I, I love the term that you use, the um, linguistic insecurity. I mean, obviously I have I have that to some extent, but I know that a lot of nieces and nephews and um, just youth in general, I know who are just youth, actually and some adults have yeah. a lot of linguistic insecurity because they've been, they've been, um, they've been shamed. Right. Mm-hmm. And um, there's a Hmong psychologist actually who had written, um, I think she, she was featured in Minnesota women's press last year. Mm-hmm. She talked about how this is, it's really about um the fact that people can't speak their, you know, heritage language as well, it it has to do with, you know, trauma and other, you know, like historical trauma and mm-hmm. other things. And I will, uh, I mentioned, you know, uh, B. Vang Moa, who teaches at the University of Minnesota. I mean, she's a Hmong language expert, but she has consistently said publicly that um, we shouldn't be shaming people mm-hmm. for their language skills. Like she yeah. of all people, right, is the kind of person you might think, oh, would be shaming people about learning right. uh, learning Hmong language. But she's like, no, you start where you're at. And yeah. um, there's no there's no shame in any of that kind of stuff. It, it, language was never meant to be to be that language is constantly evolving. Um, and it's interesting because youth actually are the ones who make language evolve. So if it wasn't mm-hmm. for you, a lot of languages would be in sick, um, you know, there right. would be languages. And so. 
um I always tell people I kind of like do a little clap back <laughs> a little <laughs> to your cards which will yes. talk about. Mm -hmm. a little clap back that I use is uh, if somebody criticizes my Somali I'm like okay so what are you doing to help people learn Somali do you have a class mm -hmm. do you have a class right. that I can sign up to like I put put the burden back on them like if yeah. your Somali is so good then why don't you share and, mm -hmm. uh, and that's basically it. There's not enough resources. Like I wish that I could have taken Somali classes in um, my college years, but this community was non-existent. Um, and even when I moved to San Diego and they had a bigger community, it still wasn't as big. So coming here to Minnesota, it's like such a huge privilege for people to be able to take multiple levels of mm -hmm. Somali. Um, but I agree with you. Language should not be something that people are shamed for. Like uh, the mm -hmm. number one motivator for learning language um, is motivation itself. So <laughs> Yeah, and I, I will say that one of my critiques of Hmong language learning is that I think sometimes there's, we you, you go and learn Hmong language and, you know, you're asked to learn really fancy words. Mm -hmm. And I, um, I've used some fancy, for fun, mm -hmm. I've used fancy words around other people I know, like my husband, my family, my Hmong friends, even mm -hmm. some Hmong people who have recently come over from Laos. And they're like, what are you saying? I've never <laughs> heard of that word before. I'm like, I know. So I feel like they, there's no value put in conversational among, but that's the kind of stuff that yeah. we speak every single day. Um, so mm -hmm. yeah, we share another poem. Sure, yeah, it around that that's time. Good. Oh, I want to mention one more thing. Oh, yeah. it's, mm -hmm. um, if anyone criticizes anyone's language, you should ask them what achievement or what you know what incredible feat did they um reach back home to be speaking the language and it's nothing they were just born there they just happened <laughs> to be born in a country where the main language is that language so right uh, but speaking of language i also have a lot of poems um about the themes of like identity and and belonging and so um actually would you like to share your post uh, your poem first since i shared last time um, sure, I could do that. This poem is called American Refugee. Um, mm -hmm. And you can see I like doing sections at one, two, three, four, five. Anyway, American <laughs> Refugee. Ours. One, when you move to a new country, you carry a potent road, a nation of lives. This may be hard to remember when your treasonous gut rapidly westernizes, when alien microbes build a hearth inside your body, when you begin losing first your children, then your name, when you must cling to numbers to prove your humanity. Two, I am envious of people who can claim a space, make it theirs. To decorate a room, put up photographs, I have never been good at this. I collect paper, scattered, torn, organized in orange envelopes by topic. Three, in high school, we learned of double speak, words with opposite meanings fused together. Bittersweet, says my teacher, fresh frozen strawberries, what others example what other examples can you think of? Years later, I am still thinking. IKEA products made in China. Hmong kids go into ESL class when they spoke English, and my green card, which reads per minute, resident, alien. Mm. Four. One day on Facebook, a man said to me, no offense, he would he tried to be kind. But what have Asians contributed here? Here, America, the United States. He would not care about artists, neighbors, railroads, paper, firecrackers, spice, general style's chicken, chop suey too. So I offer celebrities in their stead. Keanu Reeves, Ming-Na Wen, Steven Yeun, Randall Park, Ali Wong, even Rob frickin' Schneider. Enrique Iglesias, Tyson Beckford, yes, he's actually part Asian. Tiger Woods, actually, no. Dave Chappelle traded him to the whites long ago. Five. In the 80s, bullied Hmong refugees found asylum in kung fu movies on TV. Subtitled VHS tapes translated seas of Cantonese and Mandarin tongues. Ghosts taught them how to fight like cranes, dragons, tigers, and snakes, or pretend anyway. Yellow peril skin became their armor. I am no dragon like Bruce Lee. From birth, I was fated to be a ram. Elegant, creative, anonymous. Six. That's the thing about keeping your mouth shut. You wonder who you are supposed to be underneath those masks other people tell you to wear. You carve out a life in those in-between worlds. You become excavators, interpreters, mediators, negotiators. You realize you are ambiverts, amphibians, American refugees, and chameleons, shaman poets, breathing specters, cyborg mutts, nameless and renamed. You have the burden and the luxury to create a new path, 
to drown in the murk or strut out of the swamp and proclaim yourself a mutant, a member of the new revolution. Wow, absolutely love, love that. Thank, Thank you. you I like the, when you mentioned like the words that have opposite meanings and then you <laughs> you mentioned some towards the end. Um, yeah, I didn't know a lot of those celebrities were actually part Asian until you told me during that. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, wow, okay, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, thank you for sharing. My poem is called Sanadihi St. Cloud. Um, and it's basically my experience living in um, in St. Cloud, Minnesota. And I mean, it was an interesting time. I lived there from 2016 to last year. Um, and, you know, um, I didn't really know anyone in the mm -hmm. beginning. And so I kind of touch on some of those those feelings that I, that I had. And so... I will go ahead and read and then we can kind of share notes. Mm -hmm. um, years of days and months of suppressed tears and homesickness for a family I couldn't exist without. I mean, 11 people in a three bedroom apartment, you just learn to be extensions of one another. My siblings, my tribe of sisters, my shield of brothers, my ever anxious parents, we stuck together through dysfunction and dreaming. And slowly, slowly, but surely, our chaos and noise transformed into my calming soundtrack. And yet here I was, thousands of miles between us, peering outside, holding my son as he gazed at the fluffy snow, silent, but perhaps wondering where Ayeyo and Rayanne and Fortun and everyone had gone. Before I left, my mother remarked, I didn't know that it is possible I am bringing truth to the proverb, ironically sourced from nomads who couldn't, wouldn't stay still. They said, if you leave a place where you are loved, you might go to a place where you are despised. Mm -hmm. And for those first few years, I felt it around me, subtle yet there, piercing my spirit, the quietest of rejections. A professor asking which Somali graduate student I was after, your, after a year of seeing me, reducing my entire being into letters on a page, letters stringed into names that she did not care to learn and the possessors of those names, which she did not care to differentiate. And many, and many moments like those of dismissal, closed doors, a disarray of emotions, constantly consuming me. That is until I found my community. From hosting at the Great Theater to exhibits at the Paramount, sharing stories and similar struggles, Zoom calls and virtual gatherings, collectively persisting against a pandemic that tried to sow more seeds of disconnect and isolation, reading pieces of me at the Minnesota's farmer's market, mm -hmm. performing poetry to a packed house at Whitney, stepping out of my shell into the safety of a collective, representing all corners of the world, painting and poems and healing circles galore, and slowly, slowly, but surely, Lyricality, St. Cloud, Central Minnesota became synonymous with family, became synonymous with home. That's that. Oh, that was beautiful. I love the I love the journey mm -hmm. of the poem. Right. Oh, yeah. I mean that that feeling of being an outsider is is hard anywhere. Um I really want to talk about our experience during the uh fellowship and and yeah. So um, you have this amazing game that's going to be coming out. And I, yeah. if you could share more about that and what inspired it. Yeah. I mean, I get actually before we do that, maybe we could talk about what the sorry, mine has a really itchy right now for some reason. OK, uh, maybe we could talk about like uh, Finnovation in case people don't know. It's um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's a fellowship program for um, folks who under entrepreneurs who want to uh, create companies that have a social impact. Right. So. This past year, um, Anissa and I were uh, Foundation Fellows, and so we could talk about our businesses. Um, yeah, so I, I've always worked in nonprofit spaces and education spaces and art spaces, but never in for-profit spaces. So <laughs> this year, <laughs> I, I I signed up for the, I applied for the Foundation Program and started a company called um, Mayhem Games, and we create board and card games that elevate Asian Americans from sidekicks to heroes so they can power up on the tabletop and in real life. So uh, when people ask me, why did you, why do you want to start a board and card game company? I'm like, actually, it's just an extension of who I am as a person and as an artist. It's really about centering 
marginalized voices, particularly Asian American voices, right? And uh, I mean, I get hired to entertain people, right? And so it's it's an extension of that. So thank you for the um the opportunity to talk about my game. <laughs> so I started a, a, a game called Clap Back, which is, so uh, in the other part of my life, I'm a founder of a group called Funny Asian Women Collective, also known as FOC. And um, we, you know, a couple of years ago, we started doing these workshops called Clap Back Workshops, which essentially use comedy and improv to help people respond to microaggressions, right? And so uh, I thought, oh, how can... I know a lot of people are like, how are you going to turn microaggressions into like laughter? Well, I'm just going to say every time people play this, they think it's funny as heck. So, but they're probably also like me, really traumatized. But really, um, Clapback is really a game for people to like, um, I have cards that are part of the deck of oppression. Let me see if I can find them. I have cards that are part of the deck of oppression. Uh, and then people get to respond to the clapbacks by using um witty comeback lines that we offer to them i, don't I, know. I love i love that name deck of oppression yeah the deck of oppression do you mind reading uh, one in the clap back for us yeah yeah um yeah let me okay i already saw these so let me grab one randomly mm -hmm. okay so this this one is uh you must be the secretary that's what it says you must be the secretary and theoretically uh so you would What's different from, say, other games of this type where people anonymously submit, like, what they have? In Clapback, you get to say their thing, your thing out loud. Um, so, for example, I might say, you know, you must be the secretary. Uh, okay, the one I really want to say, I can't say because there's a swear word and the Independent County Library probably does not want me to say that. But <laughs> you must be the secretary. So somebody might be like, um, do you have friends? <laughs> I mean, there's another one that's cooler, but I'm like, I will not, yeah. I will not say it. Go back to them. <laughs> Make them. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's much yeah. more fun than this, but um, yeah. So uh, we're gonna, we're launching this year. So we're gonna have uh games to sell um for the holiday season. So please buy them. Uh it is Clapback, the Asian American edition, a party game to put your haters in their place. It oh. is um 18 plus. But just so parents don't get mad at us. Um, but you know, if you're you're one of those cool parents uh who doesn't care about swear words, please have your teenagers play this. It's amazing, like after nine months seeing your baby come to life, you know. Yeah. And, yeah, and how how like how many conversations you've had mm -hmm. about it, um, and I love that it's an extension of like similar to what your mm -hmm. poetry was touching on, kind of mm -hmm. uh taking up space, um, really, you know, taking control of the narrative mm -hmm. yourself. Yeah, and you know, and then I will say too that I, one of the pushbacks or curiosities I've got from people is, well, if you're not Asian, can you um. If you're not Asian, can you play this game? Certainly you can, right? It Knowing that it's, it centers Asian Americans, but there are definitely going to be well, things that might resonate with you because of race or, I'm sorry, uh, gender or other kinds of things. Um, but I also think this game could function in a couple of ways. One, if you're not Asian American, buy it for your Asian American friends. Uh, if you're not Asian American, play it. And if you are shocked by some of the microaggressions, that's a good thing. I was thinking about this. There's a microaggression in here that says, um, can I dip my spring roll in your soy oh, can I dip my egg roll in your soy sauce? Right? Yeah. And I, I bet somebody's gonna be like, is that even real? I'm like, I witnessed that. Mm -hmm. I witnessed that when I was at a birthday party uh, uh in northeast Minneapolis at, at one of the German restaurants. I was just there with some girlfriends and this dude came up and he thought he was so he thought it'd be funny to just say, you know. That's can just... I dip my my spring in my not spring my can I dip my egg roll in your soy sauce and my friend just slapped him in the face and he just thought it was so funny, but well, first of all we were like dude why are you even dipping in a soy sauce that's not good, <laughs> <laughs> not the right sauce not the right sauce so many anyway appropriate yeah, yeah yeah and then but, um, but, yeah add to that Minnesota nice uh makes you know microaggressions they it takes it up to another level <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah for sure for sure. Yeah. Um, oh. Anissa, why don't you tell us a little bit more about your company and what you were doing with the fellowship? Sure. 
I feel I'm looking at the topics we wanted to discuss and I'm like, this will probably take five hours, but <laughs> uh, we were so ambitious. But um, so my company is um, similar to yours. It's an extension of all of my lifetime of experiences. Um, originally, I had a name in mind for it. I'm kind of rebranding at the moment, but the gist of the company is that um, it's it's rooted, it's targeted towards bicultural, uh, bilingual uh, people like me, diaspora, uh, in other words, um, and it helps them basically reclaim their identity, the mm-hmm. parts that were lost, the parts that were shunned, mm-hmm. the parts that you know they never felt like they had a right to, and so mm-hmm. that includes affirmations, which kind of draws upon my um, Somali and English affirmations that I created. They're actually physical product. I'm moving towards the digital. Um, but I do have to say, just seeing your cards, I'm going to miss having the physical cards. And that might be something I just, you know, I have a small inventory of because mm-hmm. it's really powerful just holding that in your hand. Um, but I didn't want to target global diaspora because we have similar struggles in the UK and New- in in, um, in Australia and New Zealand. We experience the same exact things, uh, maybe mm-hmm. just different accents. <laughs> um, and so that's that's what that's what my company is going to be about. And um, I'm hoping to launch my first um, app in January of next year. Mm, nice. Oh, and I love uh, affirmations and I feel like they're so underrated. And yet when you affirm people, if it's so empowering, right? Just, I, I, I feel, I, I, I witness how transformative it is. Yeah. When I share the cards with people, they, um, like if I'm at an event, for example, a person comes to the table and they think it's targeted towards kids. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. why don't you go ahead and read them? And they start reading them and they're like, this is making me feel better. Like this had a huge impact on my, like, this is what I needed growing up. Honestly, they say the cards. And I'm like, yeah, that's the point. It's all ages. We can all use mm-hmm. affirmations. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Sorry. <I'm> like... <laughs> oh yeah, TED Talk. What did you do? Your... So both of us did our TEDx talks, right? Or yeah. What did you do yeah. yours on? Because you did yours um just last year, last fall, I think, right? Yeah, last year, um, my TEDx talk. I have to remember to say the TEDx part. Um mm-hmm. So it was on the power of positive language. And I talked about Mm -hmm. my affirmations. I also talked about a group of us creating um, a new term for autism in the Somali Mm -hmm. language, which is mangar, uh, which means unique mind. Um, And that, you know, was coined by uh, one of our, this collective that we had, just Mm -hmm. professionals, parents. Um, And it was kind of drawing inspiration from the Maori people who created a word for autism. And Mm -hmm. theirs uh, means... um, uh, in his in his or her, her own world, basically, which is really beautiful. Um, but that's what my TEDx talk was about. How about yours? Yeah, mine was called um, It's Okay Not to Be the Center of the Universe. And, uh, you know, it was really about how as a creative, like among creative, like people regulate me all the time. <clears throat> And so I I found I found this really interesting. Like when I was in graduate school, some of my uh, classmates, primarily who are white, were just like, "Why would people say this to you?" And I'm like, "Cause they do." Like throughout my life, people have been saying things like, "So for example, um, my play, The Korean Drama Addict's Guide to Losing Your Virginity." One of the pieces of feedback I got was, "Well, what will your elders say about this? Aren't they gonna be offended?" I'm like, "I don't think my elders are gonna come see this. This is a rom com about K drama and a K drama addict," right. or um. You know, uh, I'll, you know, even when I was writing a play about divorce in the Hmong community, because it was a thing that was happening in the, two, the early 2000s, people were like, are you okay? Are mm-hmm. you getting divorced? Um, does your husband, you know, I was at a bars, you know, like, doing, you know, talking to people, doing research. And people were like, "Is your hus- does your husband know you're here? And I'm like, oh, geez, they, they, well, I'm still married. <laughs> I'm still married. Yeah. So, but people are always like regulating me up out. Even when I wrote, did my show, a Confessions of a Lazy Hmong Woman. Hmong women, I heard, were unhappy because they, not all Hmong women, some, some were unhappy because they felt like I was making Hmong people look bad. Mm-hmm. Um, And I remember my cousin had to tell her friends, well, this is actually May's story. She's the lazy Hmong woman, you know, mm-hmm. um, and I remember I always tell the story about how I went to Wisconsin to do a show and um, they had flyers of the show in hallways. And this 
young white um, college student came to my artist meet and greet and he cried. He was crying because he said to me, I, Hmong people are some of the hardest working people I know. And when I saw your flyers, it made me so sad for your people. And I'm like, motherfucker. <laughs> No, I was like, oh, that's the life of him, but like, no, 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 no. But, but I mean, yeah, he saw yeah. the show, and then later he was like, you know, it, you know, it's all good, you know, whatever. I look, yeah. I was thinking of through an f bomb and clap back, and here I just said that through an yeah. f bomb. But, but no, I mean, but the point is that I think there's so many people who, um, I don't know if you feel this way at all, but there's so many people who tell me what I am allowed to say, what I cannot say, and so my TEDx talk was really about all of these things, like, you know, uh. And also, I think that the term of it's okay not to be the center of the universe is really that when I was growing up, because um, I'm a little bit older than you and maybe a lot, I don't know. But when I was growing up, I think we were taught to create work for the white gay gays, right? Mm -hmm. And I think there's something really powerful about knowing who you think your audience is and then centering them oh. because that actually makes the work much more, much more like Authentic. nuanced. Yeah, because even if you're writing a romance novel, you need to be writing towards people who love romance novels. You why why waste your time on somebody who 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 looks down on that genre, right? right. And so anyway, no, no long I, spiel. No, I definitely resonate with that. There's a lot of policing. There's a lot of gatekeeping. Um, one of my friends who is in the Zoom right now, um, her name is Jojo, and she's a writer, and mm. she talked about how at first. Her poetry was like translating every Somali word, every Somali word that she, you mm -hmm. know, mentioned. And then after after a while, she's like, "Why am I translating? Like, it's I'm I'm you know writing for this white gaze, and I'm just not going to translate. You're just going to have right. to fill in the blanks, you know, use the context clues, <laughs> right? Um, and that's one uh, strategy of just like really targeting your audience. Um, in the work that I do, it's very um, pro pro Somali community and also. Mm -hmm like pan-african mm -hmm. um very proud of that and i think it's just my upbringing of uh, a lack of has created this really like um this this uh, never-ending like passion and, and dedication mm -hmm. and love um and so i am intentional about if there's parts of what i'm sharing that is intended for the white gaze i go back and i'm like do i really need to say this do I really need to apologize? Do I really, you know, I, I do monitor myself as um as a writer, but I think with more um, time and experience and just mm -hmm. more confidence, um, mm -hmm. I'm finding less and less that I am truly targeting the audience that I'm, you know, trying to their, capture their attention. And um, yeah. Yeah. But it, 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 I think a lot of people are, are smarter now and, you know, more, more educated about things. And so they want more nuanced stories. Right. And mm -hmm. so I feel like, you know, I think one of the things I talked about in my TEDx talk is that sometimes when, for example, if I'm centering Hmong Americans who are bilingual, for mm -hmm. example, mm -hmm. then the kind of stories you hear, even if you're not part of that community, the kind of stories you hear are much more interesting. You get the community tea, right? You're not <laughs> getting the, you know, um, I think the example I use is, uh, you know, I, I think sometimes a lot of uh, communities of color, we tell outsiders like, yeah, the, the thing that the safe stories, you know, uh, but it's really it, it's just the surfacey stuff. It's nothing deep, you know. We're, it's like giving people Panda Express, when right. but but when we go home, we like, you know, make our own pepper and do all this other stuff. Right. So when when you're when you get to experience that sort of centering where you're not the center, you get to actually taste the authentic food. You get to listen to the real stories, and I think there's actually a lot more pleasure in being. It feels like you, yeah, you're an insider. Or you get yeah. to be, you get to watch, you know, mm -hmm. as in it. Yeah. You're invited. You're invited to the cookout and to the Somali uh, wedding or, and the long yeah. wedding. <laughs> yeah. Um, I agree. I agree. <laughs> Should we yeah. talk about community tea? I don't know. I was like, we could talk about, yeah. but we started yeah. talking about. <laughs> oh, okay. Let's see. We, we, what? we promised to talk about the, uh, yeah, we, we promised to talk about some of the spicy parts of our community and. <laughs> So one thing I'll mention is something called Nakan Elis, which is, if you translate it, it's a return to culture. And it's not as beautiful as it sounds. Uh, it's basically outsourcing your children 
to Africa uh, to get a very often uh, traumatizing um, experience of basically reintegrating into the culture and, and learning the language. And this can be done correctly or incorrectly. Incorrectly is dropping your child off to some distant relatives or even maybe your grandmother or whatever, and then just taking off like, peace out, enjoy your time here. You know, I hope that when I come back that you're well-versed in Somali, but usually, uh, unfortunately, uh, that's not the case. Um, and a lot of youth have experienced um, lots of trauma and abuse yeah. in those situations, especially if it's like a boarding school type of situation. But even with relatives, like no one is going to treat your child like you do. Um, and so the correct way to do that is to uh, maybe travel with your child and experience it together, um, or maybe shorter um, shorter uh, visits uh, that are safer for a child. Um, and, uh, you know, unfortunately, a lot of these uh, children and youth who are chosen for Naqad Alis are those who are experiencing mental health crises, or mm. maybe they have substance abuse disorders that they're dealing with, or whatever else. Or maybe they're just too, they're the black sheep of the family. And it's like, we're going to correct your, you know, behavior with this very extreme, like, I don't know if you remember MTV, uh, Scared Straight. It's similar <laughs> Yeah. You know, and I know it's not unique to my culture. I know that there's a huge um, uh, there was a documentary that I watched about how uh, many wealthy and middle class white families were doing that to their children. Mm -hmm. They were sending them off to these like religious schools. Some of them weren't religious. They were just, you know, complete like traumatic experiences. And um, so I realized like, OK, it's not just the Somalis who do this. Um, do you mm -hmm. have a version of that in the Hmong culture? Yeah, totally. Um I mean, we are too poor to send them off to a different country. <laughs> also, I guess that's what happens when you don't have a home country, right? Yeah. <laughs> Just kidding. I mean, honestly, like in the uh, in the uh, 80s and 90s in particular, um, like, I don't think people do this, do this, this day, these days, but I feel like in the 80s and 90s, uh, if you were a bad kid, you know, what I'll talk about what that means. They would send you away, right? And again, um, th there wasn't money for people to travel overseas and stuff, but you would be sent off. So a lot of Hmong people in Minnesota, parts of Wisconsin, and Central Valley, California, right? That's a huge mm -hmm. diaspora. But uh, sometimes you would get sent off to live in like, I don't know, some obscure town in like the Pacific Northwest. Like mm -hmm. you just had one like aunt or uncle who lived there or yeah. somebody who lived in the South. Wow. or east coast and so so like these would happen to kids who maybe you ran away from home or you you ran away from home once or you ran away from home a couple times so and your parents didn't know what to do with you so they would again the, they would send you away mm -hmm. uh i heard stories about girls who were pregnant who were sent away and again um so i know that back in the day right even within you know within the uh white american diaspora mm -hmm. um you know i feel like in the 50s and 60s when there were girls who were pregnant they were also sent away to until to have oh. children. So I just mm -hmm. uh, want to make those connections. So it's not just like it's our community is doing this. This is yeah, a thing. Yeah. But uh, yeah, a lot. But I remember a lot of teenagers in the um, during those time periods being sent away to live in um, a more isolated mm. spot with their with their relatives, um, hoping that the isolation would be good for them. And what's really interesting, you talked about this return to culture. And I know a lot of Hmong people are like back, especially back in those days, they want you to hold on to Hmong culture so badly. But I also know people who are like, they take their kids away from Hmong people because they're like, Hmong people are bad. Mm. You know, like uh, I know some folks, I did some work up in um, Alaska mm -hmm. and I had talked to some parents who were like, they moved up there because they were worried their kids were going to be influenced by the Hmong people who lived here in the lower 48s, you mm -hmm. know? Uh yeah. By the way, apparently Hmong Minnesotans are very edgy, <laughs> bad, <laughs> bad influenced. So anyway, so then they took their families up to Alaska so they could live, be isolated and not, you know, yeah. um, be influenced to join gangs or, you know, um, who knows what have sex. But did it help? Like, how are the Alaskan Hmong doing? <laughs> well, uh, no, the no, it didn't help because I think. Uh, you know, the time that when I was there, it felt like when I talked to some of the young people, they had, first of all, the communities had so many needs and, um, there weren't a lot of people who had, there weren't a lot of people who were culturally competent working in the system. And so 
basically they I this is somebody's gonna come after me They're, okay come after me let's have a conversation <laughs> but basically when I went there in the um you know around 2008 2009 I felt like a lot of the kids were living my 90s mom girl life right oh. and so um I felt like the young yeah I felt like the young people there uh, not just the young people, but the community needed a lot of things. But the isolation meant that they didn't have access to as many resources as they wanted to have. And I still remember that even folks in Anchorage, like in the city and other services, wanted to be able to tap into the Hmong community more. But a lot mm -hmm. of the Hmong people who live there didn't want to have that connection, right? So that's interesting. Yeah, I don't know. So I felt like there was this, I don't know. It's beautiful. People could go fish for salmon and man, they're never gonna let me go back. <laughs> <laughs> but it must be and it's interesting because Somalis also are in Alaska, but I always say Somalis are everywhere. They're probably in Antarctica mm -hmm. too, with a little yeah. bit set up. Um yeah. we I think went for opportunities like economic opportunities, but mm -hmm. um, that whole mindset of like I'm gonna get away from my community to do better, it usually has uh, you know, yeah. Uh, a worse effect where a child experiences even more mm -hmm. isolation and and that whole thing about being stuck between two communities that outcast you um yeah i feel like that narrative uh, there's a helplessness to it that it's like you're telling your child you're not strong enough for to face anything you know whereas a child should experience and even if they make mistakes they can come back from them um, right uh, irredeemable um and so we're in alaska we're also in random parts of the yeah. u.s so <laughs> we have that in oh, common. Yes. Oh, uh, you're right. Alaska is uh, really about a couple. I think Hmong people are also drawn to Alaska because economic opportunities mm -hmm. and also the land. Right. It's beautiful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, I was joking, not joking about salmon fishing, but you can also go forage. The mm -hmm. It's just, you yeah. know, it's beautiful. Right. You can live. You can be close to nature. And oh, can we like, share another piece? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Okay. No, I was saying you can. Um, you also get some kind of residence, like incentive, financial incentive. Yeah, you money. don't pay taxes, and then you also oh. get you actually get money. <laughs> Maybe so we should go. To I, <laughs> I know. I think it's something like a thousand dollars a year. You you get thousand dollars a year. So if you have a family of ten, that's like is that ten thousand, right? Mm, I, I can so, see that. But yeah, let's yeah. let's go ahead and share another poem. Yeah. Actually, I was gonna say, do you want to share this some other this other community that we had like talked about before? This, I didn't know this happened, but <laughs> the midlife crisis, <laughs> the midlife crisis of the men in our community. So, what does that look like for your for the men in your community? Yeah. So, or like, um, just... yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, Hmong people have been going through this, you know, it, patriarchal nature, uh, but you know, like. Well, for I think Hmong women have always been strong, but um, what's been interesting is living in the United States. Twenty twenty five will be the fiftieth anniversary of the Hmong, you know, my, uh, migration here to the U.S. Mm -hmm. And you know, when I was growing up, I could see feminism showing up in so many spaces, right? Like women fighting for their right to just be live, right? Yeah. yeah. And so, anyway, apparently, Hmong women got too empowered. <laughs> And so in the early 2000s, Hmong guys started going over to Laos, you know, which is where Hmong folks are, most Hmong folks in the United States are from. And they started marrying, first of all, they started marrying uh, young Hmong girls there. Mm -hmm. And then after a while, I think they started like uh, basically sexually exploiting people, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, yep. the marriage was already bad enough because, first of all, sometimes they were underage, uh, bad enough because sometimes they already had families here, right? Mm -hmm. um, but then, you know, now that has totally transformed our community in the sense that uh, we're, we as Americans, Hmong people from the United States are exploiting our own people, mm. you know, okay. and uh, people can't, aren't even the folks who live overseas aren't even guaranteed a marriage, right? A cultural marriage. Um, a friend of mine went over to Laos. This is like 15 years ago. Um, she said, she was uh, traveling up a village and I guess the their guide didn't know that she and her she was Hmong. So the guide was speaking in Hmong. He was like, I hope these Americans, this is interesting here. People are like, are you guys Americans? There, we are Americans, right? But she was like, the guide was like, I hope this, these Americans step on a landmine and get blown up. Mm. And so she was like, sir, I am Hmong. I understand what you said. Yeah. What is going on? And so he said, he's just so tired of Hmong people from the United States going over 
exploiting them because essentially what was happening is because people are so poor there when that the women and actually now men like depend on hmm. money that from the people know. in the United States. So they they don't want to date anybody local. Hmm. So it's changed the ecosystem there, right? Yes. From like change, change the ecosystem. The yeah. yeah. So what's going on in the Somali community? <laughs> Things <laughs> you and I learned about each other during lunch. <laughs> Let's see how many Somali people are in the chat. I'm just kidding. Um, so we have the same phenomenon of, uh, you know, there is polygyny, um, which is for us religiously uh, permissible. And it's really interesting now to see how uh, polyamory and there's a lot more acceptance of like that um, in, in the American setting. But like, I think there's always a right way to do something and there's always a reckless way. And so um, <laughs> there's, uh, I think when some... Uh, and I think the midlife crisis happens to both men and women, but it happens differently. Um, in my in my community, we have the strong black woman. Basically, mm -hmm. her name is uh, our version of that is Nagnol, and it's like a woman who can withstand anything. She's so resilient, you know. And if her husband divorces her and leaves her with eight children, she's resilient. She's gonna make it. And I'm like. Maybe she needs support. Maybe she doesn't need to be resilient. <laughs> um, and so we do have that phenomenon of, uh, you know, um, men going back home and uh, marrying younger women and uh, doing it reckless. And also there's a, an issue of like, like you said, just totally changing the economic landscape of a country. Mm -hmm. So irresponsible, like going back. Um, yeah. Nag, nag adag eskadeg, yep. And so um, going back and like, creating so much inflation and like making it so that locals cannot survive without you. That's just, mm -hmm. um, and you know, I, de that definitely exists in our community. Um, and I think maybe we're getting to a point where we talk about it more openly because they're mm -hmm. such a normalized thing. Um, and for those men, I'm just like, get therapy, get therapy, my brother, you probably just need therapy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you don't need to go and marry someone else. You just need yeah. to stay sit with yourself for a bit and I honestly think a lot of things go back to trauma um our community is not all trauma we're not walking trauma at the same time there is a lot of suppressed trauma and that does show up show up in many mm -hmm. different ways it shows up in domestic violence it shows up in uh, substance use disorders increasing um and then I feel like that um that also has its layers and some of the things we talked mm -hmm. about isolation and and being shunned and a lot of those things contribute to it so mm -hmm lesson of the day is get therapy don't don't get married yeah. get therapy <laughs> well ours is very public there are some national and international organizations that fight against this hmm. so so yeah. this is not a it's not a community secret anymore it's like a dude mm -hmm. i don't care if you get therapy just stop exploiting people yeah 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 especially yeah. at your age and yeah like yeah it's like yeah. religiously culturally those things are 100% shunned and looked down upon there's like yeah. history of men going back to Kenya and and mistreating women um but I feel like you know the trauma is showing up in our women as well that forced resilience is trauma and also I think there's so many things in our community that are normalized as um just oh it's personality or it's whatever preference or and it's like no there's actually something very wrong here mm -hmm. and we should probably address it and so yeah, yeah. Yeah, the spot, the community tea is definitely like it's on YouTube now and it's on TikTok and there's mm -hmm. no way to hide it anymore. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, I think we have time to share one more poem each, right? And then talk a little bit. Sure. Do you want to pick something in? Um, I would love to talk about grief for a little bit, although that's yeah. kind of a sad note, no. but like um at the end of 2021, my mother and my brother passed away very close to each other. My brother passed away first. He was 40. Um, and he he passed away at the end of November 2021. And then my mom, she passed away 40 days after that. So it was like, it was the first, you know, in our in our immediate family that experience and it shattered my world. And of course I went to writing because writing writing's my outlet. Um, and I was actually very public with it. I shared it on my Facebook. I consider mm -hmm. my Facebook like my diary. I'm sorry to everyone who follows me, but you're just gonna get all my thoughts. <laughs> um, and it's it's people have reached out to me and were like, thank you so much for sharing. Like I did that I resonate with that. And and you know, but I wrote a couple of poems about my mom. And um in St. Cloud, we actually lived in the same apartment complex. Mm -hmm. So 
there was actually also a physical like there's multiple layers of separation. And so there's, um, let's see, there's three short ones that I'll read. First one is called Hoyo, which is um, mother in Somali. I hear you in my dreams and wearing your garbasaj smells like every sign I pass looks like all the sweet memories of you feels like, like all my senses fail to remember you as you were. I was not ready to let you go. The next one is a uh, hallway. Walking down these brown stained carpets, down the hallway that led to you, but you are no longer here. I hold your multicolored batis and tira, the blues, the greens, the oranges, the reds, the glitter and sequins. Using all of my senses, I take them all in. It grants me solace that your sweet scent lingers even after you bid us farewell. And the last one is Tales of Minnesota. I used to hear tales of Cedar Riverside while a thousand miles away in Cedar Gardens. The infamous, the infamous stories traveling from colorful, uh, sorry, let me start that over. <laughs> I used to hear tales of Cedar Riverside while a thousand miles away in Cedar Gardens. The infamous stories traveling from colorful skyscrapers making their way down to our three bedroom apartment in the San Joaquin Valley. Boy was a traveler. She spoke of Minneapolis as if it was the Somali Atlantis. More life, dean, culture, community, modest clothing, children speaking their mother tongue, and mothers stubbornly clinging onto their culture as they proudly shuffled their kids to Duxi. We would sit in circles and savor the details, watching one tape through wide after another, a souvenir from Hoya's travels, with each rewatch slowly internalizing that the quiet of Fresno could never compare to such a bustling place where Somalis reigned supreme, because they reign because they reign supreme there, right? Now Hoy has traveled on further than I ever imagined. As I walk through the city that once captured our minds as youth, I take mental notes for Hoya, scented notes for Hoya, and a collection of new stories, fiercely preserving them, even though she's no longer here. Beautiful, like it's beautiful uh homage to your mom. Uh, oh, okay. I'll share. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no. I was gonna say, how about yours? I'm looking for it. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna. Sh yeah, I'm gonna share a poem about my dad. So my, both my mom and my dad are gone, and so it's my grandmother. So interestingly enough, I'm part of the oldest generation within the my Lee clan. Anyway, uh, my siblings and I are oldest generation, if you can believe that. Mm -hmm. So in 2013, my father passed away. Um, this is a poem about him. The morning after. At dawn, we gather orphan beers abandoned on countertops, the coffee table beside the couch. Our father's ghost is awake, high off energy drinks left at his tomb. In life, he was bitter with pills that slurred his speech, forced him to walk the world in a haze. He wanted to be awake, didn't mind he could no longer drink moonshine in old English. The living room brims with shots and chasers, names etched in black permanent markers, on clear plastic days when we were little and not afraid, when we were still little and not yet sad. We watched James Bond movies on Sunday nights and naively believed we could live like this man who wore his birth name and his alias in perfect harmony. No world shaken, no cover blown, no life lived under the table. Wow. Uh, that's a yeah the, the poems are a legacy for them yeah and, I know I'm yeah I do yeah. comedy but my poems are very um depressing <laughs> I say that I can only write poetry when I'm like feeling deeply emotional so but usually if you know if I have that mm -hmm. meltdown or if I'm having that bad day usually a good poem comes out of it so yeah <laughs> yeah well it was great talking with you yeah great talking to you too and Carolyn you were gonna go into Q&A now right yeah. Oh my goodness. What a powerful conversation and beautiful, beautiful poetry. I'm just, wow. Um, there's so much that you covered and what I know regarding complications with language, um, the similarities between your two cultures. And I heard some of the, some of those in my own culture as well, mm -hmm. um, which is so interesting. Um, so yes, let's open it up for questions. Um, you can either put your questions in the chat or if you would prefer to um, speak them you can 
unmute and speak your question or, or your comments. There are a couple of really nice comments in the chat already. Um, Baisa, is that how you pronounce it? <clears throat> she says, we grew up with Hmong people in California mm -hmm. and we share so many values, especially family-centered values. Mm -hmm. Very beautiful people and culture. That's my sister. <laughs> we, oh, were, really? we were one of three Savali families in, in Fresno for about 17 years. Mm -hmm. So I had friends from all over the world. The apartments that we lived in called Cedar Gardens, I used to call it the, the little UN because we had people from mm -hmm. everywhere. So, wow. Yeah. yeah, and there's also a comment from Ifra Ali. From what I have read, from what I have read the past, there are so much cultural similarities between the two cultures, according to oral history. Mm -hmm. um, can you say a little bit about oral history in both of your communities? Mm -hmm. And May, I think you already did mm -hmm. because you were talking yeah. about um, how recent the written culture is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The Somali language is even more recent. You mentioned the 1950s was when you had mm -hmm. the written script. Ours yeah. was 1970. And mm -hmm. uh, at the time, we had a president, uh, Siad Bare, and he had a competition for who could come up with the best script. So there was the Arabic script, the Latin script, to, uh, to have the Somali language. And it turned out that the Latin script, that those linguists won <laughs> the competition. And so... Somali is actually very phonetic when you read it. And mm -hmm. I think it's actually re easier to learn how to read Somali than it is to speak. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. the oral cult culture, we um, are referred to as a nation of poets. And um, mm -hmm. if there's a group of 10 Somalis, five of them are probably poets. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Hmong is not phonetic, which is why it's very hard to read. People are like, what is this? Because... Yeah. Um, we have letters that indicate the tone at the end. So oh, you yeah. you have to know the tone, right? It's mm -hmm. like in Mandarin, they'll have like signs that that will help you go understand whether you need to go, uh, or, uh, mm -hmm. uh, right? But in Hmong, it's letters. And so people are like, what is this? Yeah, um, yeah but uh, we're an orally based culture. So stories, um, histories, recipes, wisdom gets passed down orally. And I feel like there's always some kind of form. I don't know how formal it is, but I, I can track in my family who the storytellers are, story keepers are. Mm -hmm. And for me, I feel like it was my, um, my, my dad's sister, uh, my aunt who passed stories along to me. And I have also passed stories along to my niece, Aria. I mean, I, t I tell a bunch of my nieces and nephews stories, but I've already said, I already know that when, so I don't have any kids, but I'm like, I already know that when I'm long gone, I'm like, that little girl is going to hold on to my my life so yeah and in, a lot of pressure. in your books in your books as well i know you have a children yeah. we didn't yeah. get to that, but yeah. you have also that legacy yeah um yeah i always tell people to keep in mind that we're still a very much an oral culture and as you mentioned a lot of the elders are not literate in mm -hmm. reading and writing and so when uh, the school districts send out these long letters with very formal academic Somali, I'm like, what are you doing? Just make a video. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no yeah. one is reading this. And so, yeah, I think we have two more questions. Yeah. yeah. So Kia wants to know what has been, what is the mo most challenging to write about regarding your history, culture, and or identity? And then Hetty wants to wants to um, know if you would speak about challenges for mixed yeah. race among and some mm -hmm. other couples. Yeah. So there's two. Yeah. Those are good questions. Mm -hmm. Would you like to go first, Mike? I mean, I think let's, I'm going to go with Tackle Kia's story first. What is the most challenging thing to write about? I don't think, I don't know if it's the most challenging thing to write about, but one thing I, I'm always kind of curious. Well, one thing I want to talk about is the fact that because Hmong people, are, our stories are so tied to the Vietnam War. And mm -hmm. so I feel like we've been kind of crystallized in that time period. And mm -hmm. so even today, a lot of people, you, you know, younger people are still like, I, they're, they want to write about the war. Mm -hmm. And I'm very curious about what did our life look like before the war? Mm -hmm. We don't talk about that very much, right? What happened before that? I'm also really curious about contemporary Hmong lives or lives are just regular Hmong people who are going through the world again the war we're always informed by the war we can't escape it but what is it like to just um 
yeah, write a story about hanging out at a bar on a Saturday night, you know, in 2008. I don't know. I, I say that because I've written that story. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but I feel like I think that there needs to be room for people to write more of those kinds of stories. And then also people need to give themselves permission to write about that and know that I think if you want to write about the war and it feels good to you, like a natural thing that you want to do. I have my own war stories, write it, but not feel like caged in. Cause I feel like um, that is when I think about the non mong gays, right? That's the stuff that people are fascinates people about us, but I really want to see more diversity in our narratives from ourselves. I agree with you about normalizing the normal in our stories, mm -hmm. like in every day, every story doesn't have to be about a Muslim woman ripping off her hijab to be liberated mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. who, who's doing that? I don't know anyone who's doing that. Um, but, uh, you know, a lot of our stories are uh, about trauma, about being refugees and immigrants. And one of the topics we talked about is how long is someone a refugee? Like, is that a forever title? Um, and it's interesting because I see people win outstanding refugee awards uh, 30 years after they've come to the U.S. And I'm like, when does one become an American? <laughs> when yeah. does one become just one of the people, you know? And like, I can claim my story as a refugee and as an immigrant, but I don't know if I want that to be my sole identifier in every space mm -hmm. and for that to be my point of reference. Um, mm -hmm. And so I agree with that. And I think another thing is just how much... Um, secrecy exists with collectivist cultures mm -hmm. um you know Ooh. there's taboo topics and yeah there's a quote that i read where it said that uh shame and secrets die in safe spaces mm -hmm. um there's another mm -hmm. quote that comes to mind which is if you don't want me to write about it then you probably shouldn't have done it <laughs> you know <laughs> like like i'm gonna write this story um at the same time i um you know i'm very committed to my faith and i do try to adhere to um not so much cultural guidelines because they're all over the place. They're not consistent. They're just mm -hmm. a lot of it are, is rooted in uh, patriarchal thinking, but like my faith has, uh, is my compass. And I try to stay within those lines while still communicating what's really happening. And, you know, my actual experience and my faith doesn't deny me that. Um, mm. Yeah. I think those, that would be Thanks. the most challenging bringing those stories to life. Mm -hmm. Before you get Should to we tackle Hedy's question? question? Yeah. Before you get to Hetty's question, I just want to um, bring everyone's attention to Kia's reminder um, to please fill out the survey. Okay, and you can do that, you know, before you leave. But yes, um, so if you'd like to respond to Hetty's question about, yes, here it is. Whoops, I had it anyway. Okay, speaking to challenges for mixed race. Hmong and mixed race Somali couples. Mm -hmm. Do you want to kick us off? Or yeah, I can't say that I have anyone in my immediate family who is um, has a mixed race um, family, or sometimes it's mixed cultural. Um, mm -hmm. And the funny thing about uh, the Somali community is before we even get to mixed cultural and mixed race, we have mixed tribal. <laughs> and so <laughs> just within the Somali community, tribe is a big thing, not so much with the younger generation. But sometimes it's like a shock if someone from this tribe marries someone from that tribe. And it's like, oh, my God, what do we do? And it's like, you're Somali, you speak the same language, you have the same religion. Like, there's really no big difference there. Um, and I think it varies with each person. I definitely think there's still a lot of um, shaming that happens when it comes to having a mixed race family or a mixed cultural family. Like even just marrying someone from West Africa, for example, or, you know, another part of Africa or maybe indigenous African-American. It's like, oh my God, I can't believe he or she did that. But then eventually, uh, you know, there's children and they grow and that acceptance has to happen by nature. Um, and I think we're starting to move away from like, we cannot be this insular community that's like only within Somali. There's no reason for that. I, I always think that the more multicultural family is, the more beautiful they are. And I believe like the more perspectives you gain and the more homes you have, you know, all over the world. And so, yeah, but there's definitely challenges. Yeah, I mean, so I'm, I'm married to a Hmong man, which surprises a lot of people. <laughs> people, I, I, I think that's a running joke that people... When they hear about my work, which is really feminist, they assume that um that I would be married to a white man. They just I don't know. 
uh, but I am married to a Hmong man. <laughs> um, from the Yang clan, hence Meili Yang. But anyway, um, yeah. So and I bring this up because I'm I'm not in a mixed relationship. Um, but I do know a lot of friends and family members who are in um, uh, mixed race relationships. I feel like back in the day, like you know, twenty five years ago, I think that was hard um, for people to navigate. These days, I feel like it's not as much. I will say that I think the thing I wanted to maybe speak to a little bit is about kids, and one of the things I've noticed is that um, you know, I have uh, family members and also friends kids who uh, are mixed race and people don't rec realize they're Hmong right like mm -hmm. I have like nieces and nephews who are mixed like they're they're part like um, Native American and part Hmong mm -hmm. but I, th I think because their Native American genetics come out a little bit more strongly people don't make the connection you know that they're Hmong mm -hmm. or there are kids who are you know mixed like you know Hmong and black and so people assume they're just black and so I feel like I'm not a photographer, but I have always thought I like I have always wanted to do a photography series about what Hmong uh, America looks like today, because there's so many people who are Hmong. And one of the things I've noticed about the kids who are mixed is that some are they don't feel like they want to name that they feel like already feel a little bit like outsiders. And so they don't want to hmm. claim their Hmongness. And then people don't know better. And so they don't, they assume these kids are not Hmong. But I feel like there needs to be more visibility brought up about the fact that the Hmong world looks very different today. There are people who are like me and my husband. We married a long time. We don't have kids. That's different. That didn't exist 30 years ago. There mm -hmm. are families who are, uh, we're, they're, they're queer couples now. Didn't happen 30 years ago. There are people who are single, intentionally single. There are people, in, again, in mixed race relationships uh, and I feel like the the Hmong world looks very different. And I think we need to see that. Yeah. Um, I think since we're a newer immigrant community, we're getting there. Um, and um, you're right. Our, we have a thing with the recessive gene, I believe, because if a Somali person marries anyone, you're not going to see the Somali in them. It's just, that's just the reality. Um, and uh Often, like if if um, a Somali person marries someone maybe from an Asian background, um, that child ends up looking like either you know Arab or other you know uh, nationality and not Somali. But even within our Somali community and our country, we're very like we're not we're homogenous in that we have the same culture, language, and religion, but like we also look very different, and there's a lot of different roots. And so, um, since we're a newer immigrant community, people like me, a like one point five generation, we're already dealing with like so much uh, out, you know, being outcasts, and so it's even worse if you're if you're mixed with something else, and so we're in the struggle together, I guess. Mm -hmm. Wow, well, I think this is pretty much all we have time for, but um, oh, this was just a gorgeous conversation. Look like there's a couple of other things in the chat thank yous are coming in. And I just want to remind everyone again to please fill out the survey. And um, yes, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And uh, May, May and Anissa, if you could hang on mm -hmm. for a second. Yeah, thank you, Carolyn, for inviting us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for coming out. Thank you, everyone. Yes, I second that. <laughs> Yeah, beautiful, enlightening conversation. Oh my goodness! Wow. We need we need to do a part two, <laughs> <laughs> part three. <laughs> Happen part two, part three, <laughs> part seven. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this was gorgeous. There was a movie that I watched when I was younger called The Never Ending Story. Mm -hmm. Love that movie so much. So we can have our never ending Hmong and Somali story. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> I think it already is. Uh, yeah. People just need to be talking about it more. Oh, shoot. I meant to ask before we hung up, a lot of people are gone now, where we can get your cards, your, your clap back game. Once again. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, shoot. I forgot to promote the Fox Super Show, but that's okay. You have a recording. Okay. <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. Okay. Yes. By the way, before the cards, if anybody's still around, um, my great funny Asian women collective, Fox, is doing a super show at the Fitzgerald Uh. Friday, November 8th. You can find that at fockcollective.com. We're pretty easy to find. But people can find the clapback cards at my other website, which is mayhemgames.net. Mayhemgames. So mayhemgames.net. 
Or just follow me on social media and somewhere I'll I'll be blasting this stuff up soon. Yeah. Be pre-ordering. Yeah, but this is both really new. No one people haven't heard about the Fox show or the games yet. So you all are getting insider information. Right. Maybe we can put the flyer or the poster for it in the video. I was thinking the same thing. I was just gonna ask mm -hmm. if Nia can just add, you know, a little bit to the video. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. This is so wonderful. Yeah, uh, pretty yeah part of me was just like, wow, I wish this had been in person. There's like so many moments of clapping and nodding along and yeah, <laughs> it could be a mini series, as you both yeah. said. <laughs> we honestly had a huge thought, like list of topics and I'm looking at it like, I think we did like maybe four to five. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, you covered a lot and yeah, I could see, okay. you know, diving into that even, even more. So mm -hmm. thank you so much. I hope, I hope we'll have an opportunity to work together again in the future. Mm -hmm. Carolyn, so much for putting this together. This was just a mm -hmm. great pairing. Really loved just the flow of the conversation and just um, so inter so many uh, intersections and overlap mm -hmm. in our, our two cultures. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Oh boy, the wheels are turning. Oh my gosh, you know, you two <laughs> should offer a workshop series or something. <laughs> always, we're always ideating. <laughs> what'd you say, what'd you say, Kia? what's that oh i said we're always ideating carolyn we are, all the we always are. it's just yep. a matter of time